Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresno. This week, we talk about freedom, perhaps a fitting subject just a few days before we find out who our new masters are going to be in Washington. In the second half of our show, we'll speak with Catherine Mangu Ward, the new editor-in-chief of Reason. Up first, we're pleased to welcome Australian actor, writer, and film director, Topher Field. Topher, welcome to the show. Bill, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Topher, I asked you on to help explain a riddle. We Yanks don't pay much attention to what goes on down under, and most of our understanding of Australia comes from watching Mad Max and Crocodile Dundee movies. But what the heck happened to turn Australia from a frontier society into the world's biggest nanny state? Well, Bill, I'm not sure that that myth of this freedom-loving Australian has ever really actually existed, because the thing to remember is that we're based on a penal colony. We were originally a bunch of convicts. Britain wanted to get rid of all their scum, and they sent them to Australia because America wouldn't take them <laughs> anymore. Thanks, guys. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm, I am convict stock myself, so guilty as charged. But I'm not really sure that we ever fully recovered from that mindset. I'm not sure that we ever really had this idea of freedom in the same way that, that, that the American culture does, thanks to your war of independence and, and I guess the very foundation of the way your country was founded. We almost have polar opposite origins. And I'm not sure that that the image of the freedom-loving Aussie has ever really been true. In my view, I think we've always bowed very quickly to authority figures. We've never really had a revolution. We've never really had a call to arms. There was a there was a relatively minor event, or there have been two relatively minor events. One to do with rum, predictably a very Australian rebellion, to do with access to alcohol and the price of alcohol, and uh, another to do with mining rights uh, around the town of Ballarat. And uh, and that's as close as we've ever really come. And and neither of those ever really got past the skirmish stage. So we don't have a heritage or a tradition of freedom that's being fought for in the same way that you do. So I would actually challenge the stereotype and say that what's happening in Australia today, which is absolutely disastrous, is a natural outworking of who we've really always been. Well, let's take a rundown through some of the headline issues. Australia has taken extraordinary measures to reduce civilian gun ownership, introducing mm -hmm. buyback programs, gun seizures, new firearm restrictions. And I think they've taken like three quarters of a million guns off the street. What's happened to crime since then? Well, crime was already trending down before the gun buyback. So it was triggered by a single event, a, a very tragic massacre that happened in Tasmania, which is the southernmost state of Australia. It was at the time the largest massacre that had ever happened in the world. Uh, and so the prime minister at the time, John Howard, decided that he had to get rid of guns. Australia is a gun grabber's dream. We are the ideal location to be able to successfully make gun control work. Well, it isn't working. What happened was at first, crime continued to trend downwards. Now, remember, it was already trending mm -hmm. downwards before, so the trend simply continued. Many analyses have been done to try and find whether the trend changed. Perhaps it started trending downwards faster after the gun ban. No, it didn't. The trend remained the same. What we've seen in the last four or five years, though, has been a dramatic rise in violent crime. Gun-related crimes, sexual assaults, murders are much more stable, but your violent crimes, and in particular what we're starting to see now, are crimes that we never used to see before, home invasions. Hmm. It used to be if someone was going to rob your house, they would wait till you were out. Now they target the house when you're home. We're seeing carjackings. It used to be that they would steal your car while it was in the driveway. Now they run you off the road and steal it from the side of the street because they want you to be there. They want to get your keys off you, which gives you some idea of the level of fearlessness and the fact that these criminals know for a fact that you are not going to be able to fight back. There is no way. They, criminals operate in the full expectation that you will be able to do absolutely nothing in return. And what we're seeing now, as criminals have begun to realize this, We've seen a really dramatic spike in, in violent crime and gun-related crime up fourfold in the last five years. Are people reacting to this? Are they asking for better licensing laws so at least law-abiding citizens can protect themselves? There are very few sensible people in Australia. I've, <laughs> I've been classified. On this issue, I'm regarded by most Australians as just being a fringe lunatic because I actually think that responsible law-abiding people can own a gun and not do anything evil with it and use it only for, for, for good purposes. But that puts me way out on the lunatic fringe in my country. Most people who are responding are responding with, with, I guess, asking for more of what's not working. They're asking for more police presence. I always say it doesn't matter if there's one cop drawing a chalk outline around your body or if there's 10 cops doing it, it's still a chalk outline around your body. 
So more cops isn't the answer. They are reactive by their nature. Now, I have the utmost regard for, for police officers as a profession, but they are reactive by their nature. They can't do anything until a problem has already arisen. Well, at least if you get shot or mugged in Australia, you've got a famous healthcare system to fall back on. I mean, it's, well, it's often used as a model for advocates of socialized medicine. How's it working? Mm, yeah, don't talk to me about Australian healthcare. I have some personal experiences <laughs> with that. I, myself and an American friend of mine, funnily enough, were diagnosed with, with exactly the same condition, and it, it served as a little perfect little case study. So I have severe obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, it's a condition where you stop breathing while you're asleep, and if it's undiagnosed, as mine was for a number of years, it can be very, very destructive to your health, to your, your mental health, and to your ability to actually do any work and, and so forth. It, it has a number of knock-on effects. I was diagnosed in Australia... And uh, they found that my tonsils were probably contributing to the problem. So they decided I had to have a tonsillectomy. My tonsils and adenoids needed to come out. Hmm. So I was put on a government health care waiting list in this world-class socialized health care system that we have. And 18 months later, that's a year and a half. For a tonsillectomy? Yeah, for a tonsillectomy. They <laughs> finally, my, my name finally rose to the top of the list. Now, in the meantime, there's a thing called a CPAP machine, a constant uh, pressure air pump, yep. and it keeps you breathing at night. It's a mask that straps onto your face, and it, it pumps air into your lungs. You would think that if they're going to make me wait 18 months with a known serious medical condition that is debilitating in, it, in how severe it is on me uh, and has very serious long-term health effects, you would think that they would supply me with one of these machines to be able to manage my symptoms while I'm waiting the 18 months for a simple bit of surgery. Well, they didn't. I was expected to just sit there in my symptoms and wait. Now, thankfully, I have some amazing friends and I was able to get my hands on a CPAP machine. They're quite expensive, but thanks to a friend of mine, we were able to make that happen and I was able to manage my symptoms. But look at the economic side. If you died waiting for surgery, it's cheaper for the system, isn't it? It's absolutely cheaper for the system, but here's the crazy thing. People say, oh, but you, know, you want something for free. You want free health care. No, no, no. I want the health care I've been paying for in my taxes all my life. Our health care is not free. We are paying for it, and we are paying through the nose, but it's not there for us when we need it. Toll for Uber is probably the most transformative innovation in urban transportation since the subway was invented. I'll confess to being a total advocate. I mean, thanks to Uber, I don't even own a car anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's infuriating to watch the taxi cartels pull out all the stops trying to block it. How has Australia dealt with the Uber revolution? Well, every state's been different, and, and if you look internationally, you have a situation, for example, in France, where you have your taxi drivers rioting in the streets and causing all sorts of trouble. Mm. And then you have your situation here in the U.S., where it's largely accepted in most jurisdictions and, and able to operate. In Australia, we span a bit of that spectrum. So the state of Victoria, for example, has just announced that they're going to pay a stupendous amount of compensation to taxi plate holders to compensate them for allowing Uber to operate. I mean, how nice of them. They're going to let the economy and let innovation do its thing and get out of our way for a change. But they're going to slug taxpayers by paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to the holders of taxi plate licenses to compensate them for the competition. The same thing was proposed in the state of New South Wales, which is, uh, is, is not my home state, but just north of me. And uh, we decided to do something about it. So we made a little campaign called the Coalition of Obsolete Industries. <laughs> and we staged a protest rally for all obsolete industries. So these are things like candle makers and horseshoe makers. I remember makers and, that. Yeah, and the people who clean out your toilets from the alleyway in the back of your house and video busters. They've all gone obsolete because of technology. So if taxi drivers are going to get a bailout, surely the rest of us should too. Every single person who's ever lost a job because their industry has become obsolete. Well, that video was incredibly successful. We had no idea just the impact that it was going to have. The New South Wales government were saying they were going to offer, I believe it was $160,000 per taxi plate license. It was going to cost New South Wales taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. This video came out, and according to Uber themselves, I didn't know this until, until I heard from them directly. According to Uber themselves, only this video could have made the difference. But two weeks after the video came out, the final decision was handed down by the New South Wales government, and compensation was set at $20,000 per taxi plate license a fraction of what it would have been. Hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money saved out of a single video. So advocacy can move things in the right direction. Topher, mining and extraction industries are a huge part of Australia's economy. How has the country dealt with global warming alarmism? Uh, very poorly. We're, we're shutting down our coal-fired power plants right around the country. The state of South Australia has actually just suffered a statewide blackout. Now imagine an entire US state completely black. Well, South Australia is physically far bigger than, than any U.S. state except Texas or Alaska. So imagine that geographic area completely blacked out. Now, they were in the middle of a pretty severe storm, not an unprecedented storm, but a severe storm. 
and their infrastructure started folding. And because they do not have base load power of their own, they only have wind and solar and other kind of intermittent sources of power. They rely on, on other states around them to supply them with base load power. The system did not have the resilience to withstand the damage that was being done by the storm and the whole thing shut down. The entire state went dark. Just stop and think about that for a second. We are a country with coal, we're a country with oil, we're a country with gas, and we cannot keep the lights on during a, a reasonably severe, although not unprecedented, storm. We have a situation where fracking, the drilling for shale oil mm. gas, has been severely restricted in large parts of the country, and we haven't got the balance right anywhere yet. So in some states, drillers are allowed to go onto a farmer's property without the farmer's permission and just do whatever they like, which is completely inappropriate and an absolute abuse of farmers. In other states, fracking is completely banned, and even if farmers wanted them on the land, they wouldn't be allowed to have them because the state government is completely banned them. Nowhere in Australia are we getting that balance right. Victoria have just announced, that's my home state, that we're now going to shut down our largest coal-fired power plant. Now, not only is this power plant supplying Victoria, but thanks to their stupidity, it's also supplying South Australia, the guys who just had the massive blackout, and it's also supplying Tasmania because they often aren't able to supply enough power for themselves. So... I don't understand what we're doing. I think we've gone completely mad. Topher, you produce a YouTube video series called Lifestyle Regulation Madness. As we take a walk with you down under trying to understand what turned Australia from a frontier society into the world's biggest nanny state, maybe you can walk us through some of those stories. Start with the food police. Yeah. Well, this really is the next phase in the nanny state. One of the realizations that I had a few years ago is that the nanny state is never going to look around and say, you know what? I think we're done here. I think we've written all the rules we need to write. They're going to be constantly looking for that next thing. And food is definitely on the list. And we see that from celebrities and celebrity chefs around the world and regulators. They're all singing from the same songbook. We have to restrict sugar. We have to restrict advertising on fast food because people can't resist the, the power of advertising. And we have the obesity epidemic because we're allowing, you know, McDonald's to sponsor local sports games for kids and all that sort of nonsense. We're looking at a situation now where in Australia, there are states where how cooked your hamburger is, is regulated. Oh, we have that problem here too. It's madness. This is insane. The government has literally gone into the local kitchens of every single cafe, every single pub, every single restaurant and said, no, 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 no. me, the brown cardigan wearing bureaucrat, I know more about how you, the chef, should do your job than you do. But it's for your own good, isn't it? <laughs> well, that, of course, is what's said, but... Let's actually have a look at the history of the food nanny state. The food nanny state told us that fat was bad. And one of the main reasons sugar is such a, an issue today, and one of the reasons we're eating so many carbohydrates, is because we were told to stay away from fat. We were told we shouldn't eat too much meat. Oh, look out, don't eat too many eggs. Look out for that cholesterol. Oh, butter is bad for you. It's going to kill you. And we've discovered only in the last few years that almost every single one of those things was wrong. <laughs> So if there is an obesity epidemic today, and if sugar is the culprit, which is what they're now saying, then the people who caused us to get to where we are are the very same nanny state food police that are now wanting us to trust them and let us regulate our lives even more. Well, surely they'll get it right this time. And that goes for <laughs> drinking, too. I mean, Australia is famous for its pubs. How have they dealt with the lockout laws? Well, we've got a, an absurd situation. There was some street violence that happened, which is always tragic. There were some, some fatal one-punch attacks that happened in King's Cross in New South Wales. They happened at about 10.30 at night. The government's solution was to lock people out of pubs at 1 o'clock in the morning. Now, just think about that logically. How is a 1 a.m. lockout going to stop a 10.30 p.m. attack? It isn't, of course. <laughs> it was never about protecting us from violence, you know, protecting us from ourselves. It was always about this sort of puritanical instinct this desire to dictate to us what we can and can't do. It's been really devastating. So many pubs and clubs have had to shut down because they've lost so much revenue. Bands are struggling to find a place where they can play because pubs can't have them anymore. They don't have the revenue to be able to pay bands. It's the knock-on effect, the number of people who've lost their jobs. And at, at, a, at a lower level, people like me who have lost places that we used to love to hang out with our friends and enjoy a good time, all of this has happened because of some fake attempt to save us from violence that was never going to be stopped by any of these laws. But this violence was surely stopped by the gun laws we talked about earlier, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's working out really well for us right now. <laughs> so there's no way to figure out how all these rules are going to impact people in advance. And so the way to fix that is just make more of them, right? Well, that seems to be their solution. They seem to think that more of what's not working is, is all that's needed to make it suddenly magically work. Of course, people like myself are saying, well, hang on. Maybe we actually need to learn from the fact that this isn't working and maybe we need to try a different approach. And 
I'm a huge believer in, in the average person. I think the average person is far more qualified to make basic life decisions than any bureaucrat will ever be. And I would love to see us just devolving all of this network, this web of of rules and regulations and allowing people to start making their own decisions. And of course, along with that, paying the price and the consequences for their own decisions as well. You ran a funny bit on your YouTube series on the laws regulating getting around town. Your final meter clocked in at about $7,000 by the time (laughs) you got through. What's that all about? The state of Victoria is the most highly regulated state when it comes to fines and penalties for traveling around. So as I understand it here in the U.S., you have around about a 10-mile-per-hour tolerance, depending on where you are. Yeah, usually you're safe. uh, Nine miles above the limit, you're usually pretty safe from the cops. Sure. In Victoria, three kilometers per hour, that's about two miles per hour, is your tolerance. (laughs) So you can be on a freeway that is clocked at 100 kilometers per hour, And when you go 104, they will send you a fine for hundreds of dollars. And if you do that a few times, your license starts to be in jeopardy. It is absolute madness. The degree, the micromanagement of how everyone behaves out on the roads. And that doesn't just apply to cars and to speeding. It's every single aspect, as you would have seen when you watched the video. It's when you're on foot. It's when you're on your push bike. It's when you're parking your car. Everywhere you look, there is the opportunity for the government to give you a fine for one reason or another. And as you saw, it adds up very quickly. A three-minute video, $7,000 worth of fines. (laughs) Can't you just think of it as a tax? Uh, Well, a a tax on the stupid or a tax on the dangerous. That's what (laughs) I would like to have us believe. I think it's just an absolutely disgraceful effort to try and balance state budgets. So, Topher, let's get serious for a moment. Nanny state laws can't get passed without voter support. Given your outlaw history, and you've talked about that earlier, have people completely lost their sense of freedom and independence? I think we're close. I think we're very close to completely losing it. There is a small backbone, a small spine. The libertarian movement in Australia is a fraction of the size that it is in the US. And every time I visit the US, I just get this refreshing sense that actually there's people here that are willing to fight back. In Australia, we have very, very few and and, and, and a notable few. The few that we have are remarkable individuals, but there are very, very few. I don't hold out a lot of hope for Australia. And, And if you look at the trajectory Australia has been on, we've been following the US. Now, you live in the U.S. and you know that following the U.S. is not a great idea when you're looking at it from the point of view of how free people are. So, unfortunately, as I look at the present state in the U.S., I see the future of my own country and it doesn't look particularly good. Now, that's not to say that hope is lost. There is definitely a lot going on in the younger generation, which is fascinating to me. The younger generation was assumed 20 years ago to lean left. It was assumed that they would buy into everything the left of politics had to say. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. And in Australia, there certainly seems to be a very strong rebellious streak in our younger generation where they're starting to say, well, hang on, you've gotten it wrong a million times before, Mr. Bureaucrat. What makes you think, you know, I'm going to do what you say now? What makes you think you've got it right this time? And maybe, just maybe, I should be allowed to make that decision for myself. So I I think if we're going to be saved, it's going to be the younger generation right now coming through that thankfully seem to be a little bit more worldly wise and a little bit more aware of the dangers that come from government than previous generations have been. You know, you're a lot further away from New Zealand than most Americans think you are, but New Zealand (laughs) went through a major revolution some 25 years ago under Mm. Roger Douglas and Ruth Richardson to transform themselves from a huge nanny state into one of the freest countries in the world. Is it possible for that to spread to Australia? New Zealand have a different political system. They don't have an upper house. They just have one house of parliament. And what that means is that if the prime minister has a majority and a mandate from the people, then they can get a lot done very, very quickly. That's what allowed them to transform themselves so quickly. We've got a situation in politics in Australia where we haven't had an upper house and a lower house dominated by the same party in a very long time. And what that means is whoever the prime minister is, is going to have a very hard time pushing his agenda through. Now, that, of course, may or may not be a good thing, depending on who mm. that prime minister is. So there's, there's something to be said for our system versus theirs. And if, if New Zealand, heaven forbid, were to turn around and elect a socialist, you might find them moving in the other direction just as quickly. So there's something to be said for the checks and balances of having two houses of parliament. But we had a prime minister very recently in Tony Abbott who was looking to reduce our budget deficit and maybe bring our spending under control. And he put down a budget that was not at all draconian, it was not at all ridiculous, but of course the the media made it out to Mm. be. And he never got any of the spending cuts through Parliament because he couldn't get it through the upper house. He had a hostile Senate. This is a situation that we're in now where I think 
the momentum that we have towards ever bigger government and ever bigger taxation and an ever increasing loss of freedom is going to continue because someone with that clarity of vision is never going to be able to get into a position of power to really turn us around. What role does education play in convincing citizens to surrender their freedoms for the promise of safety? Well, I would say that's where it starts. And it will not surprise your listeners at all, I would expect, to discover that I was homeschooled. And often people, when they learn that about me, go, ah, right, that's uh-huh. why you're a libertarian. And there is actually a huge amount of truth in that statement. I'm a libertarian because I was homeschooled. Well, my parents didn't bring me up as a libertarian. I was brought up as a conservative. I became a libertarian in my 20s. But I had the ability to challenge my own thinking and to challenge what I believed on on issues to a degree that I would have to say many of my state school educated or even private school educated friends just don't quite seem to have that same mental clarity and the ability to actually challenge their own belief systems in the same way. So I think the education system is incredibly destructive. And I've, I've got a son now and I'm thinking about how I'm going to raise him. And as I look at the education system now, it has nothing to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic. It has nothing to do with preparing you to have those basic life skills. It is all about preparing you to say the right things and have the right points of view on all of the fashionable subjects of the day. We've got ourselves a situation now where the education system is incredibly expensive and completely worthless. (laughs) Topher, give us a reason to be optimistic. Are all democracies destined to regulate themselves into stagnation, or is there a way out? I think there is a way out. And the unfortunate thing here is the roadmap for the way out was set by the American Revolution and other revolutions that we've seen in the past. We saw that in England when, with the forcing of the king to sign the Magna Carta and, and various ructions and trouble that they've had. It never happens politely. Governments and bureaucrats do not give up power hmm. easily or politely. And so I'm, I'm quite concerned as I look ahead that things are going to have to get worse before they get better. They're going to have to get worse because people are not going to challenge or, or, or move out of their comfort zone and really challenge the government until they are really uncomfortable. And I saw that in Venezuela when I was there just recently, where people were still obeying the government's mandates when they were hungry, when their children were hungry, when they had no job, when the power was turned off for hours every day. They were still mindlessly obeying whatever the government told them to do and believing that the government was going to get them through. People have to get really uncomfortable with their daily lives before they're willing to take the risks associated with challenging the government of the day. But eventually, when that point is reached, whatever that is for each individual country, I think there will be a pushback. and I think there will be a return to the ideas of freedom. But it's going to take some effort. And unfortunately, I I don't wish for this at all. But I suspect that it will ultimately involve some bloodshed on one or both sides of the issue. Well, Topher, let's hope we don't have to go that far before we come to our senses. Thanks so much for giving us an illuminating view of the world down under. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. I appreciate it. That was Australian actor, writer, and film director Topher Field here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fressa. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. To make sure you don't miss any of our shows, stop by realclearradio.org and sign up for updates. And while you're there, check out our podcast archive of over 300 interviews. Today's program was partially underwritten by the generous support of Donors Trust, the donor-advised fund committed to promoting a free society. For more information, visit donorstrust.org. Ahead, Catherine Mangu Ward, the editor-in-chief of Reason, joins us to discuss what kind of future is barreling down on us, robots and all, and what we can do to calm down the people frightened by it. Stay tuned.